Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. A warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the Woodstock School community. We're all gathered here virtually today to launch our second TEDx event at Woodstock School. The theme this year is redefining freedom, a phrase which evokes curiosity and challenges our assumptions as to what freedom actually is. I'd like to thank each of our speakers who have shown such excitement and commitment to this event and to all our viewers who have taken the time to join us this evening. We're hoping that this will be an ongoing tradition, a meaningful ritual which will help us in a small way to ignite inspiration and passion in the young minds that many of us work for all year round. Congratulations to Team TEDx who have held forth and ensured that this event sees daylight despite all the challenges that this pandemic year has brought to us. Now over to our host to welcome our speakers and to begin today's event. A very good evening to everyone watching. To kick off the evening, I would like to welcome someone who is described as a third generation prodigy by the Hindustan Times, Bindu Subramaniam. She is a song writer and singer, entrepreneur, author, and music educator. She has been performing on stage since the age of 12, and her first solo album was critically acclaimed and nominated for the Global Indian Music Awards. She is the Dean of the Subramaniam Academy of Performing Arts, an institution that trains musically inclined children to become professional performers and pursue their musical dreams. In 2014, she started the SAPA in schools, which is a program and initiative rather to create an ecosystem for music in education in India. This program in schools works with over 30,000 children across India. Now coming in to address the question, what do you want to be when you grow up? Please welcome Bindu Subramaniam herself. Hi, I'm Bindu Subramaniam and I'm so excited to be here today. The most troublesome question I've ever been asked is, what do you want to be when you grow up? It may seem innocent, friendly even, this, what do you want to be when you grow up? But it's a question that's led a lot of people, myself included, down the wrong path of feeling that they need to know the answer to this question and that they can only be one thing. You're led to believe that you need to have the right answer, 
sometimes as early as kindergarten. When I was in kindergarten, I dressed up as a lawyer for Halloween, and it seemed like a fun thing to do, you know, walk around with a briefcase full of candy every day. So when people asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? I said, I want to be a lawyer. And judging by the looks on the faces of the grown-ups around me, I felt like I had the right answer. As I grew older, I started reading way too many John Grisham novels, and this reinforced my belief that I needed to be a lawyer. And I think it was finally halfway through law school before I realized with a sinking feeling that I didn't want to be a lawyer when I grew up. When you're asked what you want to be at a very young age and you're led to believe that there is a right answer to this question and that you can only be one thing, you get stuck on that right answer, that one thing. And that prevents you from exploring the wonderful opportunities that exist out there. And you don't have a chance to think about what you really want to be or do with your life. For those of you wondering, the right answer usually isn't law, it's engineering. Here in India, it's very common to enter at kindergarten, come out on the other side with an engineering degree, and not really think about what you want to be when you grow up. Once you have an engineering degree, you'll get hired by one of these gigantic engineering companies who like to hire engineers by the kilo, who will then declare that engineers aren't well trained by engineering colleges, then load you up into a bus again to give you the skill set that you need to do your job. And this is another important point. What we study in college may not have relevance to the jobs that exist when we enter the workforce. What are we preparing for when we study if we don't know what jobs will exist when we enter the workforce? In the olden days, a couple of generations ago, it used to be a very common thing to enter a company when you're starting your career and stay with that company the length of your career and retire from there. So if your name was Sundar and you started working at Titan when you joined as a fresher, your life became so entwined with that company that you would often get known to be Titan Sundar. You started at one company and you stayed there until you retired. Now, people talk about changing jobs every 18 months. Sometimes it's not even jobs, it's careers. We talk about the gig economy, which seems like a very exciting thing. But if you look at situations like the pandemic, it's the gig economy workers who were the first ones declared redundant. It was the gig economy workers who were the first ones asked to leave. All this leads back to a very important question. What are we trying to learn? Why are we trying to learn? I'm fortunate to work with young people every day in my role as a musician and a music educator. And I believe in the importance and value of studying all subjects, math and science, English and history, also music, art, dance, physical education. I think the new national education policy in India is brilliant because it gives young people the freedom to study so many different things create their own pathways within a well-defined framework. I think the freedom to learn and explore many different things is crucial for success. When we talk about success, we say success is where opportunity meets aptitude meets interest. But what do you know about your interest unless you have an opportunity to pursue many different things and find what excites you. Pursue everything that excites you. Freedom is the opportunity to work hard every day at what excites you. It's not sitting in your parents' garage or basement and thinking about how you want to change the world. Because hard work eats talent for breakfast every time. And remember, you don't have to be just one 
thing. We've all heard the story of Steve Jobs and how he studied calligraphy in college and his choice to study calligraphy because he had the freedom and opportunity to do so created something which every single person who's ever used a computer has benefited from the ability to use interesting fonts on a computer. So his opportunity to pursue multiple things that he was passionate about has allowed us to benefit in a very real way. In my own field, I get to see intersections of music and technology, music and art, music and mathematics. Most of these intersections and these exciting projects don't even have names, but they're driven by passion. A student of ours combined a love of music and a love of Lego and was able to create a violin that plays just by using Lego pieces. That is hard work. So my advice is wake up every morning excited to work hard about something or many things that you're passionate about. Whatever you learn, learn with passion and dedication. And don't be afraid to learn something completely different later. When you're passionate about something, you're always thinking about how the different pieces in your life can fit together in a meaningful way. I attend dance fitness classes at this place called Cult Fit. And when I go, I see how well trained the trainers are. And I see that they have hundreds of trainers conducting hundreds and maybe thousands of classes every day. And the systematic training of dance fitness trainers has created such a wonderful system. And then I start thinking about our own methods of teacher training in what we do. And I wonder how can we create a robust system where we can train hundreds and maybe thousands of teachers to do a great job every day. And I think that our teacher training processes have improved because of it. I'm also lousy at dance fitness as a result, but you get my point. In my own case, once I realized I didn't want to be a lawyer, I did the only sensible thing. I completed my bachelor's degree in law. I completed a master's degree in law because what's the point of having a bachelor's degree if you don't have a master's degree? Then I did a master's in songwriting and music business. I did uh, an MPhil in cultural studies. I wanted to know a bit more about pop music. I did a Montessori diploma. And then I got my PhD in music education. In my day-to-day -day life, I am a singer a songwriter, I'm a mom, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an author, I'm an educator, and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. Thank you. Thank you, Bindu. That was truly an inspirational talk. Now, please let me introduce Anushka Patak. Anushka Patak is a full-time public relations professional at Webner Shanwick and Karan Global Mumbai, a public relations agency. She translates learnings by her investing her past experience in client servicing towards content creation, daily reporting, and client and industry research. She's also spearheading the recently launched Accessibility by Design program for Current Global, which aims to make any and all content published by the agency accessible to individuals with disabilities. Although good food, reading, and writing have always occupied her after work hours, her lifetime goal of changing the perspective of physical disability in India takes a top seat above all. Hello everyone, my name is Anushka and I want to thank all of you and TEDx for inviting me and having me on this platform and allowing me to share my story with you. I want to start with a recent incident that happened with me. I was moving into my new apartment in Bombay in December and I was getting out of the cab and I had, you know, big suitcases. And so the, the security guard of the building saw me, you know, struggle because I was, you know, evidently struggling with like three bags. And he nicely offered to help me come and take my bag upstairs to my apartment building. And so he takes my bags, he goes to the building elevator. And um, while we're in the elevator, he's asking me general questions about where I'm from, whether I've just moved in and so on. And then there's a moment of silence. After that moment of silence, he goes, 
मैडम मुझे आपको देख के बहुत दया आती है आपकी तो जिंदगी ही बर्बाद हो गई ट्रांसलेशन टू इंग्लिश आई फील वेरी सॉरी फॉर यू योर लाइफ इज रू एंड इन दिस कॉन्टेक्सट ही वॉज एविडेंटली रेफरिंग टू मी हैविंग ओनली वन आर्म विच इन टर्न मेंट दैट आई डेंट हैव अ लाइफ सम ऑफ यू वॉचिंग दिस माई बी वॉन्डरिंग ओ माई गॉड हाउ कैन समन से दैट यूड बी सरप्राइज बट आई गेट दैट अ लॉट एंड ऑल द टाइम टू सेट सम कॉन्टेक्सट कट टू नाइन ईयर्स अगो आई एम ऑन अ स्कूल ट्रिप विथ माई फ्रेंड्स फ्रॉम बोर्डिंग स्कूल इट्स मार्च टू थाउजेंड एंड ट्वेल्व आई एम फिफ्टीन ईयर्स ओल्ड एंड एज पार्ट ऑफ दिस स्कूल ट्रिप वेर इन गुजरात नाउ बिकॉज वी वर ट्रेवलिंग इन अ लार्ज ग्रुप um you know if you're traveling in a large group with 50 girls you're using air conditioned buses so we were in the u and we were wrapping up on the beach to you know get a head start to go to the next city that we were supposed to be at and the u is actually the only place in gujarat where you can get alcohol without a permit so we're getting ready to go to the bus and turns out our bus driver had indulged in a couple of drinks and soon after that he got behind the wheel to drive us to where we were going the next thing i remember is the bus losing its balance hitting a divider flipping to the right and then skidding a few feet and everyone around me went in panic mode i remember people running out screaming and frantically all my friends were all frantically running out of the bus and one of my friends kind of saw me because i was just fallen flat to the i'd fallen flat to the right and uh, she saw me and she went anushka we got to go you know let's go and i'm telling her yeah i'm coming and my head is so dizzy and i thought that it was because i'd hit my face to the glass on the side and you know because i was bleeding from that side so i thought maybe that's why my head is dizzy and i was frantically trying to maneuver myself but i couldn't get myself up and then my friend came back and she said come on we have to go and i tried to get myself up and obviously by that time i realized that my arm was nothing but flesh and bone and there was a pool of blood to my right which was all mine by this time my teachers and my friends have also realized that i'm severely injured and the u is a very small town so there's a tiny hospital about you know 10 12 kilometers away from where we were and despite the fact that it is a small town somewhere and somehow that day there was a van full of army people and a van full of doctors because there was a parade taking place in that city those army people helped get a crane and put the bus up so they straightened the bus up and i remember this um, man uh, you know come up to me and you know he's telling me shut your eyes because when they were straightening the bus up you know they obviously didn't want the remainder of the glass to kind of go into my eyes I was rushed to the nearest hospital and by then I'd lost 60% of my blood. One of these army individuals had also donated blood to me that night. Safe to say that he's one of the many reasons that I am alive and sitting here giving this talk in the first place. Let it also be known that my parents at this point in time are in a different city altogether and all they've been told is that I am injured and I've been taken to the hospital. So what they went through that night was a completely different story because they had no idea whether I had an arm or not they just been told that my right hand was severely injured and that I had no pulse and no blood pressure There was also a teacher that night who eventually once they stabilized me rode with me to a different city that was 4 hours away where I was supposed to be taken for further medical assistance That teacher is also one of the reasons why I am here today after that another city that i was moved to i was finally moved to bombay for an extended stay at the hospital and you know for further recovery 8 months after that and after i recovered of all my injuries i was i went back to boarding school and that very teacher who had ridden with me that night in that ambulance in the middle of the night to a different city in while i was in the condition that i was in had been diagnosed with swine flu and also passed away I had basically suffered two incredible losses in one year. Now, the harder part of going through this incident is not the fact that I had that I lost an arm and then I had to, you know, learn how to do everything from scratch. 
such as wearing my clothes, writing with my left hand, and so on. The harder part of this is the societal scrutiny that comes with being a physically disabled individual or a physically disabled woman in my case in India. Because Indian society simply assumes that if you have a physical disability, it's the end of the road for you. Now I work in a relatively open-minded environment and I'm surrounded by people such as my colleagues and my friends who I don't have to justify anything to. I don't have to tell them or you know, explain to them as to how I lead my life on a regular basis. But an auto driver and an Uber driver taking me to, the, to my next destination will always bring up the fact that nobody's going to marry me. Leave that aside, there's a certain educated section of Indian society that in the past has walked up to me and asked me as to what I'm doing with my life and whether I've thought about the marriage situation with my situation. It is these assumptions that weigh you down in the long run. And even if you are thriving and doing well for yourself, they make, they instill a feeling of self doubt. And you begin to wonder that because you aren't as society would want you to be conventionally, it just makes you wonder, are you not good enough? It is also these assumptions that are the reason why accessibility provisions are essentially non-existent in India. Because if you don't talk about how a certain section of people leads their lives, how and why would you make an effort towards finding solutions to their problems? Do you all know that every time I go to a salon to get vaxxed, you know, because I'm a girl, so I have to get vaxxed. Every time I go to a salon to get vaxxed, I have to pay for both arms. I mean, there's no, because there's no provision and it's a standard price. So every time I'm at the cash counter, the cashier gets really awkward and then he or she doesn't know what to say. And then they charge me the full 1000 rupees. And I mean, there's no way that I'm getting two arms vaxxed. So, and that is the problem. The problem is that there is no conversation surrounding people with disabilities in India. And that is why there are no solutions to the little things that we have to deal with on a regular basis. I realized the lack of accessibility provisions in India when I first went to the United States. While I was there, went to the United States to study, while I was there, nobody was staring at me. Nobody really questioned how I was, you know, if, when I was going to, how I was leading my life. Nobody ever told me that, oh, you don't have an arm, so your life is over. They never scrutinized me. They simply lauded me for leading the life that I was leading. And they never questioned as to why I was in a 50 people dance class or why wall climbing with one arm was a good idea. It was that sense of normalcy that gave me the confidence to be in that 50 people dance class in the first place, despite the fact that I knew that I probably wouldn't get most steps right. It made me feel comfortable in my own skin. That sense of normalcy is what was essentially acceptance for me in my case. And I felt so accepted that by the time I moved back to India post-graduation, the scrutiny stopped bothering me. I started brushing off the stares and the questions. I remember in my early days after my accident, there was a point in time where I would walk into a restaurant or any crowded place and I would pretend to be on my phone because I knew people were staring at me. So I would pretend to text even though I wasn't texting anyone and I would rush to my table because I simply did not want to acknowledge the fact that they were looking because that would make me very uncomfortable. But that isn't the case anymore. I realized that I may not be able to change the fundamentals of society, but what I can do is change the narrative and change my narrative. The bus driver who was the reason behind this accident and the, the reason for this lifetimes, for a lifetime's worth of damage done to me, served a mere three months in jail and he's out and walking free. Now, I definitely cannot do anything about that absurdly reduced sentence, but what I can do is that I can do something with my life. I realized that all I had to do was turn the why me, why did this happen to me, into unfortunately me and what's next. I realized that the alleged limitations that I thought I had and that, were, that I thought that were preventing me from doing the things that I can do today weren't bothering me because I couldn't do anything. 
they were bothering me because they were being reinforced by people I didn't even know. So I broke free from the cage of that scrutiny and from the weight of that scrutiny by realizing one and one thing only, and that is that I can do whatever I want. I realized that you don't need to prove yourself to everyone as long as you are at peace with the fact that you are doing great. Because when you are comfortable in your own skin, you exuberate a sense of confidence that makes the others comfortable around you. I realized that you don't need two hands to clap back at society and tell them that you can in fact do everything that the people around you can, if not more. And that is essentially what redefined freedom for me. I channeled my energy towards doing things for people like me. I've worked with NGOs in the past and the current, my current workplace has a program that is working towards making all written and video content accessible to individuals with cognitive disabilities. This is how I managed to find the positives in a tragedy like this one and actually reap the benefits out of it to move ahead and move forward. And this is what you can do to make differently abled individuals like me a little bit more comfortable in their own skin and in their society and in society. One, normalize. Normalize conversation around the fact that there is a certain section of people that may not look as conventional as everyone else, but still manages to do the same things and lead a normal life, if not more, on a daily basis. Two, spark a conversation. Talk about the struggles that people like us go through regularly because only then will you be able to assist them and find solutions and make society more inclusive and accessible to all. Three, and the most important one, always keep an open mind because you never know a person with a disability, visible or not visible, may have the potential of a lifetime and may actually surprise you with what they can do after all. Thank you. Thank you, Anushka, for your interesting insight. I'm sure all the people watching are intrigued by your thoughts. Next, I would like to introduce a well-known sports writer, author, actor, and YouTuber who has covered multiple Cricket World Cups, written two books, and is also the lead villain in an Amazon web series, known as of source in the digital space he is the face of a popular youtube channel fake it india a satirical take on the indian television setup and current affairs woodstock is proud to have him as an alumni please welcome jamie alter class of 99. hi there my name is jamie alter class of 1999 graduate of woodstock school and i'm here today very happy that I was approached by Woodstock to give this TEDx talk. Well, a little bit about my career. Uh, I'm a journalist, a writer, an actor, and over the last, let's say, year and a half, also a YouTuber. It's really funny how, how life uh, sends you down a direction which you perhaps had never envisioned you'd be, you'd be going down. Um, so yeah, after graduating in 1999 from Woodstock, where I was there for about eight, eight and a half years. I set off to the US, as you often do when you graduate from Woodstock, to a scenic little town in Ohio called Worcester, where I studied at the College of Worcester. And uh, it was in the year and a half or so after graduating from Worcester that I spent largely in the Boston area uh, that I realized that uh, A, I did not fit in uh, to the States having been born and raised in India, despite being a fourth generation American in India, I was by all accounts Indian. So it was a mixture of being a little homesick and not sure what I wanted to do with my life and also being being in a job just outside Boston where I was not really, really happy. And uh, a day came when I remember I shoveled ice and snow off my car and I drove down Route 9, the 45 to 50 minute drive. And I got to office and I sat down and, you know, and I asked myself, where do you see yourself in, in five years? And the answer came back to me, definitely not behind this desk of this insurance firm outside of Boston. So as things happened, that mixture of being homesick and really wanting to do something where uh, I incorporated my love, which was, which was cricket and writing, I said, I want to become a cricket writer, a sports writer. The topic of today's uh, 
TEDx talk is maintaining your identity in times of trolls and hatred. Uh, it's a topic which I, I know a lot about and I've chosen because I think in this increasingly shrinking world of ours, when you put yourself out there, you know, in, in the visual medium or the print medium, be it as a writer, a blogger, a content creator, you know, um, I think in many ways what we've seen now, especially due to the pandemic and the subsequent lockdown, everyone is now able to become a content creator just by flipping their 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 camera or, or you know or just the camera screen or putting on um, pressing record on their phones or whatever device you have to capture images and and video because you can now go on to YouTube Instagram Twitter so many different social media and visual medium avenues for you to uh, to become a digital content creator and uh, this is the space that I I found myself in when I took the call to leave mainstream media and see see what I could do on my own could I could I successfully run a business like a website could I could I try the acting um, so I've I've been part of a few web series and a few movies a lot a lot more of this kind of work is coming out uh, hopefully by the end of 2021 or early 2022 so like I was saying when you put yourself out there uh, be it your thoughts or you open up your house to show where you live or your recording videos as as many of us did during the lockdown um, you have to then accept that people not everyone's going to like what you do not everyone is going to agree with your views and in these in these increasing increasingly shrinking times polarizing times when uh, people can hide behind an anonymous name or a display picture on social media and and abuse you or call you out or just say anything they want to say I'm not saying it's all negative. There's a lot of positive uh, comments and feedback and really a validation of, of good things which you do. I, I can say personally the work, um, the kind of things that I did uh, during the lockdown, um, both on my personal channel as well as on my cricket channel and as well as on my wife, Meha's channel. She's a sports anchor. The things like this have really taught us that, you know, people will will appreciate and value what you do, especially if you can put a smile on their face and make them feel happy during during unprecedented times like the like the COVID nineteen pandemic, but you also have to uh, to deal with the negative that comes. And um, I'll, I'll be very honest with you: there are times when you know you, you put up you put out a video where you thought it was it was enlightening or entertaining, and people would bring in a whole different strand and say you know various things. I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty here because a lot of it is 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 uh, is not even worth replicating here. But you know it's very very important to maintain your identity and uh, and it's 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 been a challenge i uh there are times when you know it 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 hits your ego it hits your morale you wonder you know really can can one comment put you down can one comment put you in a funk can one comment make you feel like it wasn't worth it and and you learn you know it's a constantly evolving process uh where you realize that you know hey people are not are not going to uh, are not going to agree and to my mind you you have the option of ignoring these people, ignoring the trolls as as they're called, um, or you have the option of you know saying, hey, um, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and convince someone, I'm going to try and ch uh, change someone, I'm going to try and you know figure out why this person is, is so negative, why they have this hatred even in inside them, you know. So you have these challenges. It is not easy. Let me be very very brutally honest with you. Uh, there have been times when I spent hours engaging with. At times, an anonymous person, because I wanted to, I wanted to clear first of all their misconceptions, and I wanted to clear the doubts. Because uh, when you put a when you put a comment on on someone's social media platform, on on their YouTube page, anywhere where that person's views and and identity and even their persona, their character is out there, unless you go and delete that um, that person's comment or that or their or their or their criticism, which you have the option of doing, but then. That can also cannonball and spiral into a whole different can of worms, which I would suggest not going down that road. Uh, but when you, so I said, you know, I'm going to try and I'm going to try and you know clear these misconceptions because their comment, if you choose to not delete it, remains there, and others can be influenced, and others can also buy into the lies, the hate. So there were times when I really engaged with people, you know, late at night, 11, 30, 12 at night, you know, hours after I put out a video during the lockdown, um, and I'd be saying, you know, where where does this anger come from? Where does this where is this frustration? Where do, where do you get these misconceptions from? And a lot of them would keep going on about different things. And these were totally baseless. They had, they had not done their research about who I was, 
who you know my background, my my authenticity as a as a journalist, as a YouTube uh, content creator, all 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 sorts of things. And there are times when you're halfway through these arguments and you wonder, is it is it really worth doing? What am I going to get out of this? But I stuck by my conviction that I I wanted to a spread just spread positive content, nothing negative, nothing vile, nothing which brings another person down. Um, and part of that, part of the whole process of, of putting out something which you believe uh, people people should know about or people want to know about based on their feedbacks and suggestions, part of that is correcting the doubts, dispelling the uh, the skepticism, the misconceptions, you know. Um, and as uh, as someone born and raised in India but who does not look Indian, you can imagine um, how many misconceptions and misgivings and uh, it's just different thoughts people have about you. So part of my whole process to sort of veer into into YouTube and see where it goes is because I got a lot of questions about, you know, um, who are you? You know, can you please tell us more about yourself, how you landed up in India, how you how you speak Hindi, what you do. And of course, being the being the son of an actor like uh, Tom Alter, can you please tell us more about him? Uh, what it was like growing up in the household, same as, as, as your father, did you go on movie sets? All sorts of these kind of questions, which are frankly very, very personal, but I think very, very relevant questions. Um, it was it was a way to answer these questions, and like I said, to clear misconceptions about myself, my family, my father, uh, through through a wide medium like YouTube. Um, the process has been fantastic. I've learned a lot. But when these negative comments comments come back, how do you how do you uh, do you choose to reply? Do you ignore them? And like I said, I've I made I made a conscious effort to to try and address most of them, and just going back to the whole theme of this talk, it's very very important to keep your identity in these increasingly polarizing and shrinking times when uh, someone like me, who's who's a journalist, who's in the media, and who over the last year and a half has also taken to acting, um, theater, web series, movies. Uh, the more you do this, you do put yourself out there and. While while being on social media is is a choice you have you have you can either be there you can not be there, um, it is a very good way to network to you know to to become popular so that's a choice which I made years ago as a journalist specifically a journalist in the digital field I made that choice to go out there and be on 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 most of the popular social media platforms fully aware that there would be times when I would be I would be uh, frustrated and angered by what people say and you know. 10, 11 years later, here I am, you know, still getting frustrated and angry by what people said. But I firmly believe, is my conviction, that you you need to not uh, bow down, you need to not be affected by these people. And it's easier said than done. Because um, like I said earlier in this, in this talk, there have been times when even one comment can make you sort of sit back and look at your phone or your laptop or your iPad or whatever device you use and be like, really, is, is, is that all that this person um, this person who might have been not, it's not even his real name, they're hiding behind a, a fake name or a fake display picture. As Is what they're saying, is that gonna, gonna, gonna affect you? But you know, um, I, I, I sort of take it on the chin and I said, I'm gonna do this because it's very, very important to maintain your identity. Don't let someone, don't let a troll or a coward or someone um, you don't know, don't let what they say get, get, get you down. And I have many, many friends and colleagues who do in fact get get deeply affected by what happens and you know and we talk about you know do you reply do you block uh, many people just block them but you know trolls can can come back from a different account because it takes literally takes a few minutes to make an account and slap up a fake picture or a fake name or whatever um, you don't need to get into IP addresses and, and all that stuff to, to, to really you know it's not, it's not worth it but so so many people are out there just you know with their own views and especially here here in India we've seen over the last seven, eight years, how, how things have changed, you know, how having a voice which does not agree with the establishment is, is, is frowned on. And if you're, if you're, it can even get you in a lot of trouble. Um, again, I don't want to veer down that, that very negative avenue right now, but I just want to stress, I just want to stress on how, how I've, I've taken, I've taken this route and, um, I, I can, I can give you some examples w without getting into the, into the nitty gritty, but you know, um, one of the common mis misconceptions I have is that uh, I'm an Anglo-Indian, and I, I've tried to I've tried to clear these doubts, saying no, you know, not 
what I am does not fit into the into the term Anglo Indian because I am entirely our lineage is entirely uh, American. There is no there is no um, mixed race um, element to to who who the Alter family is. But yes, that said, my my grandfather was born in India. My father was born in India. I am born in India. My son Caden is born in India. So yes, we are Indian by 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 all aspects, just not in ethnicity. So in in uh, in answering many comments, because people will comment saying, "Sir, can you please stand up for our Anglo Indian community?" You know, your father did not do anything for the Anglo Indian community by getting into politics. You know, we've lost rights. We've we've lost certain seats. Uh, in the house of, 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 um, of you know in the MP MP legislator and I replied being like you know look I understand where you're coming from but look I am not Anglo Indian and this has then led to various um, that there, there have been some high profile uh, politicians who then tagged me on Twitter saying you know please please do something for the community so in 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 trying to dispel such doubts uh, you do get comments about you know well why are you here you your family your family was we're guessing there were missionary families who came to who came to convert and you know all all these sorts of things so you don't you don't you try not to even get down that line you you stick to a point where you you try to clear the doubts and try to clear the misconceptions but you know you, you don't want to take on something which then can spiral into something else but it's it's in dealing my point being it's in dealing with with questions and uh, and uh, criticism and even negativity um, of these sorts where people have just has ch chosen to paint you paint you with a brush, you know, by just typing out a few words. Um, you can either get stuck in a hole or you can try and say, no, I'm I'm not going to take this. And um, there have been times when I've been told, why don't you just get off social media? Why do you put yourself out there on YouTube? But I stand by, by uh, my beliefs that, you know, that mine is a very interesting story. And the majority of the videos that I put out on, on YouTube um, have been based on questions about gen you know, genuine interest in what I do, in what my family is a uh, what, where my family's from, what my father did, and uh, and also just just to speak about my my career as as a journalist, it's been now fifteen and a half years that I've been writing on, on cricket, predominantly, but also I've covered a range of sports. And as you can imagine, when you write an article which which takes a, um, a different view or, or raises hard questions, you know the amount of the, the amount of people who get back to you. I remember in two thousand thirteen, the great Sachin Tendulkar. Um, was was at the end of his international career, and I and I felt he had really prolonged that career for too long in the pursuit of that hundredth international hundred century, and um, I felt that he was he was blocking uh, the the path for younger players to come in, and this whole and the nation, the marketing, you know, the whole the whole media seemed to be you know just consumed by Sachin Tendulkar's elusive hundredth hundred which no one had ever achieved and I wrote a piece saying you know literally and the title was um, for God's sake such and just go and even without reading the article and reading my points there were like hundreds and thousands of just people commenting on Twitter and on the website you know which is good to get views for the website but which my boss liked but I was like where is this hatred coming from you know you don't know anything go back go back to your country you you Britisher um, and I want to say, hang on, I'm not even British, but you know, that's just one example of the kind of misconceptions people can can take from something you've written or something you've said as as a journalist in the media line without understanding, you know, or even without even reading what uh, what what you've actually gone to say, gone on to say. Um, so yeah, while it's while it's been utterly fascinating, utterly rewarding these past fifteen and a half years. Uh, as a journalist in the digital realm, working for some really, really amazing companies and making amazing contacts and having great colleagues and good friends, there is this side that you have to be fully aware of when you choose to put yourself out there. It is that people are not immediately or automatically going to like what you say. Um, and how do you stick to your guns? How do you stick to your convictions? How do you, how do you, how do you not change your own ways? You know, you perhaps could be tempted into changing what you write based on you know, negative feedback, but no, I, I've chosen to keep my identity. I've chosen to not change uh, the way I, I think, the way I write, and now, as it turns out, over the last year and a half, the way I go about my, my digital content creation. Um, so yeah, this is something which, which I believe about, and I think it, it, fits, it fits very well into Woodstock's TEDx talk here. And um, so thank you, Woodstock, for giving me a chance to come and speak a bit about what I do and how and, uh, and how I cope with these challenges uh, on social media and being um, a, a public figure. So I hope you've enjoyed today's talk. Um, come find me, say hi.
drop a comment, negative, positive, whatever, and uh, I'll be sure that I try and answer you. Thank you for your time. God bless. Thank you, Jamie, for that wonderful talk. I'm sure that there are many sports enthusiasts in our audience who are very inspired by your work. Adi Manral is a singer-songwriter based in Missouri and is also a current Woodstock staff member. He draws inspiration from the mountains and usually explores the theme of compassion, hope, and motivation through his songs. Now he will be performing his recent song, Landor Sky, an ode to Landor where he is based. From the mountain top, where the clouds are beneath my feet, where my heart starts to sing this tune, I know it's the land or sky, where the stars are spread across the flow. Where you smell the smoke from the burning wood There's only one place this could be It's the land or a sky You may never know Just what I'm talking about if you found a home up here There's no way you'll ever go Where you find the mules on the sides of the road where the deer plays on the mountain slopes There's only one place this could be It's a land or a sky You may never know Just what I'm talking about Found a home up here. There's no way you'll ever go. You may never know just what I'm talking about. If you found a home up here. introduce our student speaker, Janvi Padar. Janvi is a mildly funny, informed optimist who wants to help create a sustainable future. She's a senior at Woodstock School and hopefully after May, a college freshman. She wants to use her experience as a student, a leader, and a Gen Zer to work towards addressing climate change. She's a current editor-in-chief of the school's newspaper, an intern for the Community Engagement Department, and an active member of the Student Council. Most recently, while working with Nazdeek, a legal empowerment organization. She spent some time learning about inclusive development in the marginalized communities of Assam. Please let me introduce Janvi. 
Almost four years ago, when I first joined Woodstock, I fell in love with the hillside. The pink and orange winter line, the monkeys that hop from tree to tree every morning, and the charming little cafes. It was all part of our town's charm. But about two years ago, I saw a very different side of this town. We were on our way back from a field trip when our chaperone, Mrs. Mark, asked our driver to stop. What I saw here, just about 500 meters from the library chalk, the center of our town, was a massive landfill, a rather common sight in India. This landfill holds decades worth of trash from Missouri's 30,000 residents and the hundreds of thousands of tourists that visit the city every single year. Given how common landfills are in India, what shook me about this particular one was seeing shanty houses stacked right on top of the landfill. Little children, about the same age as my seven-year-old brother, were playing barefoot with tires and sticks in the muddy puddles. A frail metal grill is the only thing that stood between them and this pile of filth of the city's discards. <clears throat> How many people can each one of us think would call a landfill home? This day is imprinted on my mind. It got me thinking about a whole lot of things, the most important of which was the future that I currently saw versus the version of the, version of the future that I wish to see. The unfortunate foreseeable future is one with the consequence of all the landfills we've built, the fossil fuels we've burned, the ecosystems we've destroyed, and the species that we've wiped, wiped out of the planet. A future that is frightening just like the landfill. A future where we, the people, are forced to fight for, ev for our very own survival every single day. And in the process of fighting for this survival, we lose what's most important to us, our freedom. I've recently discovered that the word freedom has no set definition. To me, as an 18-year-old, freedom means having the opportunity to celebrate one's individuality without the barriers of societal constructs, such as wealth, class, gender, race or religion. To those kids on the landfill, freedom probably meant just having the ability to live without a reminder of our selfish world every day, to chase each other, because the rest of the world seems to have forgotten them. I believe that each and every one of us has our own personal definition of what freedom means to us. And whatever that definition is, believe me, it's under a massive threat. The sixth mass extinction, a global emergency, an existential crisis. I'm talking about what is otherwise called the climate crisis. Over the next few decades, life as we know it will cease to exist. Ecosystems will collapse. Thousands of species will go extinct. And soon, billions of humans will either be displaced or will die. Freedom will be a thing of the past because we'll all be busy, we'll all be busy fighting for our survival. And whether you want to believe it or not, well, you will be affected by the climate crisis in more ways than you can count. It doesn't matter who you are, how much money you have, or where you were born. The climate crisis will become the biggest, most painful reality of our times. Climate change is the biggest threat to our freedom, and we've already seen this in many parts of the world today. In the past decade or so, droughts have become extremely frequent in Africa, happening at least once in every two years. The, recur the recurring famines and droughts have greatly increased poverty, hunger, and have caused major conflicts. In 2007, for instance, the country of Sudan witnessed what was the world's first climate change conflict. The conflict, which started as an ecological cli crisis over a decade ago, has caused political turmoil, a civil war, and has left five million people without food security. It's also killed about 2 million people. In the past few decades, climate change has been the key risk multiplier for so many of our political and military conflicts, especially in Africa. Soon, this will become the reality of our entire world, and climate-related conflicts will threaten our peace, our democracy, and therefore, our individual freedom. However, as an optimist, I still believe that we can make it out of this we will find a way to survive. But what I also believe more importantly is that climate change is an opportunity. Now you may think I'm crazy, but here's a very recent example. COVID-19 was a massive challenge for the world, 
we saw economic recessions, political turmoils, toilet paper shortages, and way too many TikToks. But we also saw fascist leaders fall, marginalized communities take charge. And for the first time in history, we saw people fight for equality and justice like never before. During this time, most of us chose to willfully curb our own freedom and for the greater good, as a result, I believe that we're more united and more connected than we were before. We're now at a crossroads with an abundance of opportunities created by the pandemic. For instance, we can reimagine learning in schools or we can completely strengthen our healthcare systems. What I'm saying here is that with every challenge comes an opportunity. The climate crisis is the biggest challenge that we've ever faced and therefore it is also the biggest opportunity. We can either sit back and bear witness to the impending doom of the world as we know it, or we can create a much better world, one that is much closer to utopia than we have been told is, is possible. We can break the rigid and oppressive economic, political and social systems that have guided us for far too long and that have led us to this day. We can truly redefine freedom through the creation of a world that is much more egalitarian and just. We can do all of this through a concept that I like to call inclusive sustainable development. Now what exactly is in inclusive sustainable development? Inclusive in this context simply means the inclusion of all people, of all communities in any development. It means I, I'm talking about real inclusion, not tokenism. It means the empowerment of those that have historically been marginalized and exploited. It means the consideration of those that are affected by our choices. And it means the equal celebration of everyone's creativity and individuality. The reason inclusivity is so important is because marginal, marginalized and exploited communities have not only suffered the consequences of others' actions, but they've also been excluded from economic growth and development. Sustainability, according to the internet, is meeting the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. In practical terms, sustainability means adopting new principles, building new lifestyles, and creating a new normal. The trick really is in creating a new normal, and I really want to stress that. A normal that encompasses new social orders, one where sustainability is not seen as an option, but it's seen as a compulsory way of living. It means creating a foundation that is so strong that we never have to face another crisis like this one. Development, as I've studied in politics class, is the stable increase in the standard of living. However, for this development to be inclusive and sustainable, we will need to focus not just on absolute development, but on relative development. What I mean by relative development is simple. It's addressing economic, political, and social inequalities while still developing. Through development that is both inclusive and sustainable, we can solve a myriad of social, political, economic, and humanitarian crises. By solving these problems, we can bring justice and equality to communities that have been at disadvantaged because of the development, because of the developed world. And by doing that, we can ensure that no child has to grow up in a world where their home is plagued by other people's trash. We can ensure that people, no matter their socio-economic or cultural background, have the opportunity to be the architect of their own freedom and of their own future. Here's the thing. Like I've said before, multiple times in fact, we're now fighting for our survival, which is the very fabric of our freedom. In this fight, everyone has a role to play. The urgency of climate change demands every single one of us to act. It demands us to use our privilege, our power, our skills and our voices. Every industry, whether it's fashion, food, technology or travel, will have to adapt and become more sustainable in order to survive. From here on, we're going to have to change every single aspect of our lives. From the food we eat, to the cars we drive, to the clothes we wear, to redefining what need is. We will need to account for the social, economic and environmental costs of our actions and 
of living the realities that we've been living for far too long. The first step is becoming a little more empathetic and a little less selfish. We need to think not just about our own freedom, but about the freedom of the billions of people who will be affected by climate change and by our individual actions. As consumers, we need to think about, we need to be conscious of what we buy and how often we buy it and of what businesses we support. As thinkers, we need to think of creative, sustainable alternatives and we need to act on making these a reality. As citizens, we need to think, we need to demand our leaders uh, to prioritize climate justice and action. I also believe that my generation, more specifically, has the most responsibility in fighting climate change than any other generation before us. Now here's why. We're responsible for the creation of a sustainable and inclusive world because we're ultimately going to have to live through the consequences of climate change. We need to act and we need to act now. We can no longer wait for the very generations and governments and corporations that have led us to this crisis to be in control. We simply cannot trust the generation and leaders before us. We have to take control and we have more power than we know. Look at Fridays for Future, for instance. A climate strike started by a single young girl is now a global movement with millions of supporters. Now I'm not saying that you need to do something of this magnitude. All you really need to do is understand the gravity of the climate crisis and factor it into every single decision you make every single day. So to all my classmates, juniors and seniors, here's some unsolicited personal advice. Make sustainability and inclusivity a guiding principle in everything that you do. Every single one of us has a role to play. Every single one of us has a responsibility to ensuring that in the coming decades, we use climate change as an opportunity to create a more just, more equal, and ultimately more free world. I'm still figuring out what my role is in this fight against climate change. But I do know one thing, like all of you sitting here today, I have a role to play, and I can only hope that you see your role too. Thank you so much, Janvi. It's great to see our generation take action towards climate change. He started making music at the age of 15, passionately performing at countless school events and social events. His hit song, Abhi Jao, is gaining traction with over 25,000 plays on various different platforms. I'm thrilled to introduce Ishan Mehra, class of 2021, who will be performing his newest and unreleased single, White Sand Diamonds.
Bani Nanda. Bani Nanda's love affair with patisserie goes back to when she first experienced a taste of her mother's delectable homemade cakes. Armed with a degree in physics, this rush eventually led her to the Le Cordon Bleu Paris. A twist at the Delo, one of Paris's oldest patisseries dating back over 400 years, brought out her passion for French pastry and desserts. Closer home, she worked at some of the most notable kitchens including the Oberoi, New Delhi, the Lila Chanakyapuri and Hyatt Regency. After a very successful stint, Miam was born in a professional studio that she set up at home in 2015. Bonnie loves experimenting with flavors and techniques, and that is seen in all of her products. She also enjoys teaching and hosts an array of baking workshops for aspiring chefs and entrepreneurs. Hi, I'm Bonnie Nanda, and um, I'm a pastry chef, and I'm really happy, and so I'm I feel blessed that I am here today and I can talk about my journey and I can maybe give an ounce of motivation to someone out there. I really, really wanted to become a chef and I was extremely mesmerized by the profession and by the fact that you can make a living out of cooking and I loved cooking. I was pursuing a degree in physics and I came back home one day and I just broke it to everyone that, you know, this is... This is not my calling. I, I do not feel passionate about physics. A part of me felt like, you know, you come out of school and you just have to do a degree because India is extremely academically inclined. And at that point, I couldn't really understand, okay, I'm studying physics. I, I had science when I was in school, but what do I make out of this? How can I make money out of physics? It left me very, very clueless. So I remember coming home and I remember telling my parents that, you know, this is what I really want to do. They were, they were not upset, they were, they were just really confused and they couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel. It took some convincing, maybe not a lot of convincing. My parents are very liberal and, and they're very forward. They packed me off to Paris and I started studying. I went to culinary school over there. If you, if you ask me about my personality, I was always free-spirited and extremely whimsical. You know, when I, was a, when I was a kid, I had this book. It was a book about things. You know, one of those kid books that you have to fill. And it said, what do you want to become when you grow up? And it had like 50 professions. And I remember picking almost 35 professions. I wanted to become a pilot. I wanted to become a detective. I wanted to become a chef, of course. Uh, I wanted to become a teacher. I was always told that, no, you can't be so many things. You have to focus on something and you have to eventually find one profession. And I think I was four and I remember my mom sitting next to me and she said that, oh, you know, like chefs earn a lot of money. This is not true. Eventually you become a head chef and, you know, the, you're paid really well because only you can make that dish. This is not true. And she's like, yo, you can become a chef one day. Someone like me needs that freedom. 
I just need to be pushed off a cliff and I'll figure my way out. I was extremely, extremely sure of that. So I started my business in uh, 2015. It was all an amalgamation of my passion, uh, my freedom, and the fact that I got a head start and the fact that I had really progressive and really supportive parents and they just kept pushing me. For me, freedom equals to financial independence. I can't press on this enough. I can't tell you how exhilarating it feels to finally turn financially independent. And I can't tell you the amount of respect you feel for yourself every day when you wake up. Being financially independent is important, but it has its flip side because, you know, when you're young, it, it can go straight to your head. You can develop a certain air about yourself. I think it's very important that at the end of the day, we all must feel very humble and very thankful and every day I should feel, I should wake up feeling all the gratitude in the world. And that's something that my mother helped me factor in. I want to talk about all the struggles I, I went through. I want to talk about how important it is for people to take you seriously, especially when you're running a business. I want to talk about the way people looked at me and the way they undermined all my efforts into building whatever I've built today. A lot of young girls, they, they've been following my journey and I think, I feel like today I'm proud that I can inspire girls and I can inspire young women to, to lead their way into businesses. You have to break the mindset of the society. I've been trying to do that for six years now and I feel like it's an everyday procedure. It's an, you do a little bit every day. I'm a free spirit and I feel like being a free spirit stems from a lot of passion and confidence. I feel like you can have all those things about you, but they need to be inculcated in an environment that helps you feel free on a daily basis. And that's the only thing, that's my entire fuel and that's the only reason I, f I am where I am today. I was never a motivated person for the most part and it took a lot for me to gather all of my whimsical thoughts and channel them. If you ever feel that you lack motivation, I, I would advise you to go back to your roots. A part of me probably went back to that, uh, that kid book and it went back to those pages when I was picking like 30 professions. I feel like it's never too late and if you have an ounce of passion and if you have the courage and you have the right circumstances and you have the environment and you have that platform, there's, there should be nothing stopping you. So when I made that transition from uh, being a home baker, I met my husband and we opened a, a bigger studio. A lot of a lot of us, we I'm here giving my my talk and we don't really talk about our shortcomings. We don't talk about our failures. But once we made this grand shift, we were getting a lot of things wrong. We were chasing uh, an entire dream of owning a cafe, an experiential cafe, and it was really failing. I don't think we understood that failure until uh, last year, 2020, until um, uh, COVID hit and we entered lockdown. And it gave us some time to assimilate our game plan, uh, to assimilate our life together individually as a, as, as a couple. Um, and we really broke it down. We had that time. I'm very thankful. I'm very thankful for that break I got. The whole of last year helped me put back all the pieces and restart and relaunch uh, my business and it helped me process things differently. We changed our game plan, we changed our entire strategy. Um, I remember when we opened in the lockdown, I ran the whole operation without my team alone, uh, single-handedly. I used to do all the kitchen work and my husband used to answer all the calls and take all the orders. And we used to go home and we used to look at each other and be like, we are literally doing this alone. There is, and the entire operation is running on just the two of us and we have to hold it together and we are holding it together. I think it gave us uh, this sense of pride and this sense of motivation that we carried through. We, we made a big breakthrough with our business last year. We, um, introduced different diagonals. I started teaching, I started taking workshops. I, I uh, introduced a lot of menu items. We launched a website. So another thing that gives me uh, a sense of freedom is the fact that 
I manage my own social media for my personal page, for my business page, and it gives me a platform to talk about my life uh, on an everyday basis. I don't know how many of you really know how to completely extract social media, but I'm someone like I'm someone who's taken the maximum advantage of it, and it does bring a sense of freedom to the table. Uh, people hear my stories. They they know what I'm doing. They know they know that oh I got a new oven today or I'm I, I got a new puppy. I would like to believe that I brought neoclassical French patisserie to Delhi at a time where people were very afraid of trying new things. They were very comfortable ordering you know old school cakes and and pastries and they they couldn't understand uh, where I was coming from. But I kept pushing. I kept. I was very very stubborn and I built my business on saying no. Can you make me a purple cake? No. Can you make me a fondant cake? No. Can you please deliver my cake to I don't know where Narnia? No. And I kept saying no and it really helped me shape up a brand. It really helped me um define everything that I stand for and everything that I would want my brand to stand for. Uh, if I look back and if I want to analyze, okay, how did I, how did it all fall together? There are some important uh, factors that I would like to talk about. Firstly, if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting out on your own, it's very important to do every single thing from scratch on your own without any help. I'll give you an example. I signed up to become a pastry chef, okay? I I don't know I didn't know anything about running a business I didn't know what a current account was I didn't know B of banking I didn't I think my accountant just wanted to run away from me I did not have bills I didn't keep files and keep folders I didn't know what taxes are I don't know what type of taxes hit you in the face eventually I had to struggle a lot because I just signed up to make cakes and a lot of people don't talk about they don't talk about their bad days. They don't talk about they. People think, oh, this is a nice talk, uh, and we're gonna hear really positive, motivating things. But let me tell you, like you have bad days, and this is my. This was my. This was the worst day that I've ever had to experience in my business. There, we we were so overwhelmed and overbooked with orders for uh, for Rakhi. That you, someone ordered a cake like I mean, someone ordered their Rakhi order for 9 a.m. and at 11 p.m. they don't have their order. I don't know where their order is. My manager doesn't know where their order is. Uh, the logistics guy doesn't know. Even the rider doesn't know where their order is. Okay, and this is the kind. This is the kind of pressure you face where uh, you might have a new time. You might have a first time customer. Okay, and they see you. They see this really rosy picture of you on social media, and then they expect. They expect the sun and the moon from you, and you can't deliver. And because you're clueless, you have you you're just falling apart. Everything is falling apart. And there were times I I remember that night. It was eleven thirty, and I had broken down. At there were tears in my eyes, and I was talking to clients. They were yelling at me. I remember one lady. Uh, she said, "You know what? Just deliver my cake." On the other hand, you have one lady. She hasn't received her cake. Or it's been all day. It's been all afternoon, all evening, and I we called her at 11:30 at night, saying, "I'm so sorry. Uh, your, your there's there's an issue with logistics. We were overbooked, and we couldn't we couldn't handle our, our workload." And you know what she said to me? She was like, "Oh my God, you guys are so hard working. You're working till 11:30 at night." <laughs> and I was like, "My God, like she doesn't have her order. We've we've given the worst possible service." That we could ever ever give to a customer, and she is she's appreciating us, and she's so touched by the fact that our generation works really hard, and it's eleven thirty, and she doesn't have our order. I feel like if you've been given the, the opportunity to feel free, and that you have or you've taken your business to this extent where your your actual problems that you think are bad problems are really good problems, you know that actually you should be lucky. You should be lucky that. You're slammed with orders that you can't deliver. You can't meet the expectations because your order list is that long. All in all, I can say and I can conclude that the the all the factors that I've spoken about and the way I have moved forward and where I am today is simply because I don't think I really followed any rules. I really don't think I have a rule book. Um, I just believe in sheer passion and hard work 
and humility and I think all of those are beautifully linked to feeling free and being, being on a path and choosing a path of freedom. I really hope that you can gather something from today and I really hope that it stays with you as a part of your journey. Wow, what wonderful ideas and thoughts shared today on our very own platform, TEDx Woodstock School. I wanted to take this opportunity to thank everybody who has helped us in making this event a success. Firstly, a big thank you to our speakers who have scripted and recorded their talks and ideas so we could share it with our community. We have learned so much from you today. A big thank you to our leadership who have always encouraged us to experiment with new ideas and be creative. A thank you to our audience who have been so encouraging and interactive. Without you, TEDx Woodstock School would hold no ground. And finally, kudos and congratulations Team TEDx for making this event a big success, for endless hours of dedication and commitment. Thank you and hope to see you all again next year. Have a wonderful evening.